Welcome to MJ Hobby Corner everyone. I am MJ and I will be your host for this video. Uh, today uh, this is an MJ uh, game spotlight and for those of you that don't know that are new to the channel or have not seen my game spotlights it's simply a video where I pull out a random uh, miniature rule set from my library and talk about it. I don't do real in-depth reviews, uh, there's no real talk about strategy, we're just talking about the game, the mechanics, and if I have uh, time, uh, many spotlights will incorporate a little sample of a combat or of a, of a turn, okay, just to kind of give an idea how the rules work. Now for this spotlight, I won't be doing a little sample turn, that will come afterwards, I will have more on the game that I'm about to talk about okay so that's in essence the MJ game spotlight now I do have a new series that came out that's uh, going to be a companion to this and a companion to Julie's uh, series what's the fluff she will concentrate on the fluff of a particular game and uh, my other uh, expansion to this uh, talks about miniatures miniatures and only miniatures right so that's sort of a, a approaching it from a distant context so together these videos will take care of you know game rules miniatures and fluff right and when they do coincide with each other we will connect them together so all those aspects of the game will be talked about all right so without further ado let's dive into it so on today's spotlight, we will have the game Silver Bayonet. Silver Bayonet by uh, Joseph McCulloch and Osprey Games. And this came out sometime in November 2021, so it's pretty uh, recent. November or December, I can't really remember which one. But <clears throat> it came out in 2021. It's it's a very recent game. And this game was brought to my attention by uh, subscriber Maurice. So shout out to subscriber Maurice thanks for pointing this game out uh, as soon as he pointed it out I went online checked it out and uh, saw that it was something I would be interested in now <clears throat> before we get into the the rules in the book uh, the book starts with a little bit of fluff right and it gives you an idea of what's going on it is a game of Napoleonic gothic horror now <clears throat> It's a very interesting theme because what really attracted me at first light was the fact that uh, you had the Napoleonic era, the Napoleonic Wars as a background, okay? And I found that to be very different. Um, so I, I, I was definitely interested in this aspect of it. Now there is, I'm not going to go over the fluff or anything, that's Julie's job, but basically uh, just to give a little bit of background. Basically, your war band is going to be a very elite war band of monster hunters with this whole Napoleonic uh, theme in the background. So the war is going on in the background and you have a mysterious force called the Harvestmen, which are also in the background. And, and this sort of dark, mysterious force is what's driving all this supernatural stuff to occur. So these elite soldiers, which will represent the player, um, are in charge of fighting this, you know, uh, with the whole war and everything that's happening with the war in the background. So it's a very interesting theme. And that's all I'll say on the fluff. So um, <clears throat> your monster hunters will be led by an officer and uh, the book uh, then goes into a creation of your warband. Um, your monster hunters will be based on a particular nation of the time. And I found that to be very interesting. So you can say that this is a little bit of gothic horror, alternate history, right? And, and fantasy as well. So it's like all these three elements combining to form this game it's a very um interesting theme if you really think about it so basically uh you will choose a major nation so you'll have nations like prussia great britain france of course 
and you can choose other nations of the time. You don't necessarily have to stick to the list. And uh, Joseph McAuliffe does mention that in the book. Uh, one note, uh, this book does not have as much art as some of the other books like Frostgrave, right? Uh, for those of you that don't know, Joseph McAuliffe is also the author of Frostgrave, Rangers of Shadowdeep, Oathmark, uh, Ghost Archipelago. All those games are also uh, part of this author's series. So he has a lot of really good games out there. You don't see a lot of art like you do in the other books. The other books, this this book, The Silver Bayonet, reminded me a lot of Rangers of Shadowdeep, including uh, the format of the book and basically some of the mechanics that we're going to go over in a bit. So the book is about 230 pages, at least the digital version. OK, so it's a it's a chunky book. All right. So let's get back on track. <clears throat> so this is a game that. So like Frostgrave or Rangers of Shadowdeep, uh, your characters will level up and you will have things that occur within the game and some things that may occur, you know, post game as well. OK, characters can level up and gain experience. Um, going back to recruitment, once you've chosen your nations, the nations uh, of the period will determine um, what soldiers you can get for your army list. OK, and one very interesting recruitment mechanic is that your officer is going to have a points value in parentheses as part of his stats. And that points value is going to tell you how many points that officer has to recruit soldiers. Now, in the soldier stat, you get a point value that's not in parentheses. It's just a number and that will indicate how much that soldier costs, right? So again, nations will determine what kinds of soldiers you can get. So every nation has a slightly different soldier makeup available to it. So that's interesting too. It gives the nations a little bit of flavor, okay? So the uh, book goes into what you need to play. As always, you will need miniatures. Uh, probably gives a lot of room for conversion this time period, I would think. You need a few markers and tokens, some terrain, a deck of regular playing cards. And that's where I found things very similar to Ranger of Shadowdeep, uh, because you will have clue markers and you will have like events and things like that. So you will need a deck of cards, the unit sheet, a pencil. You will also need 10 sided dice. This game uh, mechanic is driven by 10 sided dice. Now you will need several and it recommends three different colors of dice. OK, and uh, the colors are given in the book. It will assign a color to each of the kinds of dice that the 10 sided represent. They will represent a skill dice, power dice and monster dice. So three different Ten, three different colors and three different kinds of 10 sided dice. OK, now um, at first, this all may sound uh, very complicated, but one of the things that surprises me about uh, many of McCullough's uh, games and books is that when you start playing it, you actually see just how well it flows, you know, so it, it's definitely a game I want to give a try. Um, so we're going to continue now with the so we were at the 10 sided dice. So this uh, game requires 10 sided dice. OK, now the book explains each thing very well, as I was just about to say, each of these different things that you'll need will be explained in the book and why you will need them. Um, and then again, we go back to creating a unit where you select your nation, you select your officer from that nation and start recruiting your characters. OK. Um, now attributes and skills. This is a game that just like any of its sibling games, um, it has a lot of attributes, a lot of skills, uh, things that your character, uh, will later use to grow and gain experience, right? There is a very, very, um, comprehensive section on equipment. Now, it, one of the things that I found interesting, of course, is that this era is the era of black powder weapons and artillery. OK, so uh, this is a very interesting era. 
uh, from, from that point of view. And so you will have things like muskets, blunderbusses, uh, pepper guns, you know, all these things, even explosives, right? So it's a very interesting era to mix with the supernatural. Um, <clears throat> so you will have tables. Uh, this game does utilize tables like any games of its type. Um, it, it is an adventure game. And uh, the tables on weapons are very comprehensive. It gives you all the information you need. Okay. Um, and then we go on to scenarios. The book has 10 scenarios. And I always like this uh, when uh, authors include a lot of scenarios. Because it gives you, it really helps you to uh, understand the game with each scenario that you play. And uh, as I suspect, each scenario is going to vary in complexity. Okay, so you will have scenarios that are best for beginning play, and then as you go, you start to get better and better, then more things are thrown into the scenario, right? And you'll be able to do more things and stuff. So that's interesting. The mechanics of this game also relies heavily on uh, the checks system. The check is basically you have a target number or TN, and then you have to you have an attribute that will usually modify it, and then you have to roll that target number or over that target number to succeed. Okay, so it is a, a system of checks, basically. It's the way I is what I refer it to. Um, we see this in a lot of games, in, in a lot of the sibling games to Silver Bayonet. Okay, now uh, the game. Uh, let's move now a little bit into. We're going to start to talk about combat. That is the juicy part. Of a lot of these games and uh, the turn before we go into combat the turn is broken up into phases uh, the phases include initiative it includes a primary player phase right in which the primary player and this is in a two-player game the primary player activates half his half its figure figures rounding down okay so if I have seven figures the game the uh, rules suggest you basically activate three figures, right? So it's seven, but you just round down, so you activate three figures. Then you have a monster phase where all the monsters are going to activate, whatever's on the board. And you have a second player phase, which is obviously your opponent. Now they get to activate all their figures. And then it goes back to the primary player, which he activates whatever's left over, right? And then uh, that's pretty much it. Now, the initiative phase uh, may trigger extra monsters, and that's optional if you want to do it that way. It gives you rules for that. So some monsters may actually enter if you roll very low on the initiative phase, okay? So that would increase the um, difficulty, I think, of the game a little bit, but it's optional. So, so okay, so we, we've talked a little bit about the phases uh, this game, uh, one very interesting thing about the turn mechanic for this game, it is not in a, a game of opposing roles the way uh, you do, let's say, in Frostgrave, where you have to beat your opponent's roll, right? You have a bunch of modifiers, you roll, you add some kind of stat, you then add whatever other modifiers are, and then you have to roll over your opponent to succeed. Right? And then you subtract the differences and that's how you get your damage. This is different. Here's where the mechanic changes. In this game, you have, um, when you're doing a combat, you have the power dice and the skill dice. Okay, So the power dice and the skill dice are added together. Right When you roll them, so these are just random rolls, you add those together and you add the combat stat. And now you are comparing that to your target's defense stat. And now that will determine if it's a hit or not. If you hit, damage is calculated depending on the weapon that you use. So if I'm my character's using a fencing sword, the skill dice will determine the damage. And that's why you want different colored 10-sided uh, dice. So that makes sense. And if your uh, character is using more of a power weapon, such as a big axe or something, a power weapon, you will use the power dice. Now, the difference between the power dice that you're always going to add, you're going to add a one 
to that role. And that's what differentiates the power dice from the skill dice is that it's always going to do one point of damage more. Okay. So I thought that was an interesting mechanic. Um, I want to put this to play and again in in my next video uh, talking about this game I think I do want to do a couple of sample turns and we're going to run through maybe a sample scenario but call it a training right and we'll we'll make the mistakes together and we'll you know we'll talk about whatever mistakes I make or whatever but I do want to experiment with the system because it sounds like a very interesting system okay so we'll see and we'll talk about whether you know complexity and all that in in a future video but in essence this is the mechanic the power dice and skill dice so that's very interesting okay so these things are checked against a defense stat and that's how you're going to determine uh damage and combat in this game Okay, there is a fatigue mechanic uh, incorporated in this rule set as well. Um, fatigue, it, it depends on the game, I guess. Some, sometimes I don't like it. <laughs> it just adds something else, right, to keep track of. But um, this is not a bad system. Uh, really, uh, the fatigue mechanic, you need uh, tokens. You will need a couple of tokens to determine this. And basically, you get minus one defense and melee attack on your melee attack rolls and on your defense for every fatigue token that you get. Now, fatigue, it's obviously triggered after combat and after certain events, whatever, right? So, your figure gets a fatigue token. Now, no worries because it is, it is an elegant system in that you cannot put more than two fatigue tokens on the figure so really you're only going to get minus two uh in every situation from fatigue so it's not too bad also fatigue disappears after the turn is over you get to remove those tokens and you can start fresh so that's not too bad okay your figures are not going to be uh completely penalized you know but it is an interesting mechanic so that is a note on fatigue now the combat order is explained very well in the book i'm not going to go over it but it explains the monster ai and all these kinds of things things uh that i think you will find very similar to uh frostgrave or rangers of shadow deep or any of these games right um there is a section on cavalry specifically cavalry and this is interesting because the napoleonic era of course Cavalry was a big deal, okay, in the, in this era. So it definitely goes over like mounting and dismounting characters and that sort of thing. So that, that's cool. There's a simple terror mechanic, which is associated with morale and courage. I'm not going to say too much about that, but it exists. Now, the fate pool mechanic is another interesting mechanic of this game. So... As I said, you're going to find a lot of things very similar to Rangers of Shadow Deep if you play Rangers of Shadow Deep. But once you get into power dice and skill dice and you get into the fate pool, things are really different. And it's, it is going to feel very different uh, from Rangers in that sense. Okay, So the fate pool mechanic is basically you're going to have your two power dice. And these are extra dice, by the way. So you're going to need a handful of 10-sided dice. You're going to need your two power dice, your two skill dice, and one monster dice. Now, Fate Pool is affected by the scenarios that you're playing. Okay. But basically what a Fate Pool allows you to do, it allows you to get re-rolls. Re-rolls on misses. Uh, for example, if, you try, if you're doing a check and you miss the check, you miss the target number, you can use a particular Fate dice to reroll for combat as well um it also uh, allows for quick reloads of weapons now we are in a musket era so uh, a quick reload uh this particular action if you're using it from the fate pool gives you a free action so quick reload becomes a free action and in an era of muskets where these weapons do take time to reload that's a really good thing right it's a big benefit so interesting and then uh it also allows you to change monster behavior it allows you within within certain rules you can actually change 
what target a monster uh, is attacking. You can even move a monster away from a clue token if you needed it to move away. So there are some rules to this, but uh, that's interesting. So the fate pool becomes uh, exactly that. It's a fate mechanic incorporated into the game that will then uh, allow you to make certain changes in your favor. So it's a worthy mechanic. Okay. Um, we talked about monsters, the monster AI. Now there is a section in the book right after that that talks about, after we talk about combat and all that, get into scenarios. Then we get into the solo game. There's a whole section, a whole chapter dedicated to solo gaming with these rules. So that's great because again, you know, this is a game that you can play solo, co-op, or two player. All right. And we're seeing that a lot lately with games you know you're you're seeing that whole uh kind of diversity of gameplay which is very good uh, i think at least so okay so basically that was the fate pool that's a very important mechanic very important in combat um chapter four deals with campaigns with all the experience levels that you get uh, researching of items that you might find because you will find artifacts and things like that off-game and in-game things, right? And then power ranks. That is explained in the book. As you get up in, in experience, you also get power ranks and things like that. Um, there are 10 scenarios in the book. So again, plenty of scenarios. Now, these are two-player scenarios. You also have a good number of solo scenarios. So you're getting a lot of scenarios with this book. Okay, uh, it explains a little bit about the narrative in chapter six after talking about solo play. So solo play is very narrative. Two player games can be more uh, you versus me kind of thing. You can still add narrative to it, but I think uh, according to the to the book, the solo play is uh, a lot more narrative. Right. Okay. But you can go either way. I'm sure you can add narrative to any of your games. Um, so solo scenarios, so it goes into that and it goes into the narrative of solo scenarios. Then we have the bestiary in chapter 7. And it's uh, very similar to all the other uh, rules, you know, typical, typical stats, your move stat. Now in this game, you will have a defense stat as well as an attack stat, okay? So, uh, and also an accuracy stat for shooting. Uh, so... Uh, that takes care of that. Now, in Chapter 8, we start to get into attributes and spells. You will have a lot of spells because this is a game of supernatural uh, combat. You know, it has a lot of supernatural elements in it. So you do get spells. And uh, I'm not sure. I will have to look up the uh, what character these spells are associated with. I don't think it's your officer, really. Um, but you get a unit sheet in the back of the book and that pretty much the whole book summarized. Okay. So the most important thing about the combat is that the combat is not uh, pulls rolls with your opponent where you have to beat your opponent's rolls. Um, the damage is not then subtracted the way you would in sibling games. But this one is actually you're rolling, you're adding your, your combat stat and any other modifiers to combat and then you're comparing it to your opponent's defense stat being a monster or being whatever okay or or an opponent's figure so a uh, very interesting game and, and very interesting that the nations you know you have the different nations for the napoleonic era and that's going to determine your soldiers you know what you can choose for each nation. So I, I thought that was very interesting. Silver Bayonet definitely has caught my interest. Julie and I may be looking at it, at it in the future as a co-op game or possibly a player to player game. Um, and so we'll see. Um, I think this game will have a lot of potential for good terrain scratch builds, uh, especially looking at some of the terrain for that era right so you probably you will be using your forests your trees you know your old barns your your houses maybe your ruins right because it, it is a war story in the background so uh a lot of the terrain that you probably most terrain collectors most gamers would have 
you know, something in this kind of theme, right? And if not, you make it or you use whatever you have available. I mean, paper models, whatever it is, okay, books, whatever it is. Uh, but definitely for me, it will inspire a few like scratch builds, I think, in, in this whole uh, theme. And uh, you do have rules for terrain, uh, as usual, you know, difficult terrain and all these things. Um, one thing I like to talk about when I talk about uh, put a game on the spotlight is uh, whether or not this game has uh, web support. Now, I deem web support as forums. Uh, face group groups or any group on social media like reddit discord whatever where the game may have a group where people talk about the game show off their models they show off their terrain whatever places that you can go and get ideas for the game and learn more about the game what i'm doing here is basically part of that whole thing right that's the way i i look at web support for a particular game also youtube battle reports okay so all those things are what i consider web support uh yes this game has a lot of web support uh if you go on youtube uh gorilla miniature games has covered this game and ash from uh ash barker from uh gorilla miniature games he's very thorough his reviews are very thorough. You'll get a lot of information. He has a review for this game. And he also has battle reports. His less, Let's Plays. And I myself will be looking at his battle reports. Because I really, I really enjoy his material. But also because he's very thorough. You'll get a lot of information about the game. With his uh, stuff. Okay, so definitely check out Gorilla Miniature Games. Um, for Silver Bayonet. Also, a face group group. Um, and I repeated that, sorry. Uh, but a Facebook group, there is a Facebook group out there. It has a, a little uh, over 2,000 members, close to 3,000 members for the Silver Bayonet. You could definitely hop on there, join, and I'm sure they have uh, a ton of material for this game. So you will, if you're new to it, you haven't heard about it yet, or maybe you've heard of it, but haven't really uh, uh, looked into it yet and you want to look into it, definitely check out Facebook. And I'm sure Discord and uh, the other one, Reddit, would have something on this game. And the Renaissance Troll, which is Joseph McCullough's own blog, I'm sure would have something about the game as well, okay? So uh, there's plenty of work, uh, web support, okay? Plenty of blogs and forums that will... Uh, talk about the game in one context of the uh, or the other and I will certainly have something in the future or a couple of some things in the future for this game okay because I'm definitely going to look at it in the future and have a couple of battle reports here so uh, again thank you very much for uh, two subscriber um, Maurice for uh, suggesting this game to me in one of the comments and if you have a game that you play that you want to suggest to me i'll definitely look into it if it's not if it's something that our low studio budget can actually uh get then i will definitely get it and put it on the spotlight right so um yeah you can definitely leave me uh your games of interest in the comments and we'll see we'll see what happens with that so uh thank you very much folks and this has been an mj game spotlight i don't have a turn review for this game and for the miniatures in this game again look at my companion series mj's uh miniature spotlight where i will talk about some of the miniatures uh for this game and i may make a just a special little video talking about the miniatures conversions for miniatures and any other things because i'm still kind of gathering my thoughts about uh the miniatures that I would use for this game. Okay, so definitely look out for that if you're interested in the Silver Bayonet. And I will make sure that I link both these videos, okay? So this was a, a simple spotlight on the game and I hope you like it. And definitely, if you haven't heard of it, check it out. I mean, Joseph McCullough is a very good, a very good game author. Definitely one of our favorites here. Okay, so uh, all right, folks, enjoy the day, and I hope uh, to see you guys very soon.
We'll talk in the next MJ Spotlight.